Hi, everyone. Um, I feel very important with the smoke and all of the effects. Um, so I will uh, uh, try to make this talk um, sound as important as it is. So today, um, this is what I'm going to be. I'm Bethany Halbrick, by the way. This is my topic. Um, but what we're really going to start with um, talking about is this statement, which I'm sure everyone here has heard, knowledge is power. Um, but my question for you is, do you really believe it? So who here really believes this statement? You can raise your hand. Yes, knowledge is power. But if knowledge was a commodity in the physical form, um, more than it is in now, then would it still be power? What if we could transfer knowledge? Like, what if you could actually take your knowledge and transfer it somewhere else, and then actually receive knowledge from other places? That would be a little wild, right? Yeah. Um, so this is actually already in existence, and it's called Brain-Computer Interface, BCI. And some people call it Brain-Machine Interface. Um, this is basically a uh, communication pathway between um, our brain's electrical activity and um, an external device, like a computer. Um, this has been around for a while and is continuously being improved and worked on. Um, a few uh, years ago, Mark Zuckerberg announced that Facebook would be devoting hundreds of millions of dollars to actually further developing this, basically um, providing a mechanism to allow our brains to uh, type 100 words a minute without actually physically typing. But, um, and he's doing this in a secret lab, by the way, which I think is very interesting, called, um, well, it's, it's not uh, secret enough to not have a name, but it's called Building 8, or it was called Building 8. Um, and Elon Musk is actually taking this way further by developing a microchip that will actually allow us to not only send information, but also receive the information. So think about what that means. Like, will knowledge actually be power if it's commodified and transferable and possibly democratized? Or will it become a luxury? What, what does this mean? Um, so, in an experiment, the subject um, was asked to envision the Mona Lisa, and the computer actually generated a image of Natalie Portman. This is not the actual image that the computer generated later on. After this, you'll see what those images actually look like, but um, I found this, this uh, photo online and I thought it was very funny. Um, so, but you, you can see the facial similarities between the Mona Lisa and Natalie Portman, right? Um, so speaking of Natalie Portman, this is a, a swan. The subject was asked to envision these things. This is what the computer generated. Um, so it's, it's kind of scary how, how close this is, that the computer can actually read our mind. So what does this mean for us? if knowledge is actually transferable? Does it mean that knowledge is still power? I truly believe that if knowledge um, is not necessarily power anymore, then what we're left with is our own creativity, our own minds, what we have, our thoughts, But creativity is a complicated thing because it's a buzzword we hear all the time. Um, we hear it alongside innovation, sustainability, creativity. So we don't often actually think about what that truly means. Well, I am a big believer in authentic human creativity, which is not this. Um, this is a, this is very interesting and inspirational, um, but it's an image, it's an AI-generated image um, 
from a platform called Dolly, which you can just, I mean, there, there are a few platforms like this, but Dolly specifically is very interesting. Its software is very advanced. Um, and you can actually type a sentence in, and it will generate an image for you in the style that you've specified, if you do specify a style. Um, but the issue with these images is that um, they're not actually so much ground in reality, because these images only take from what the software knows, so what the artificial intelligence um, has the data to morph. Um, so as you can see here, um, this, this was a prompt, an astronaut riding a horse in a photorealistic style. Um, and then in another style and another style, these are the images that were, um, that were generated. But as I said before, they're only based on what the computer knows, only the styles that the computer knows. Um, so I, I typed into Dolly, uh, solutions to a sustainable feature at the most amazing sustainability conference in Lisbon. And these are the solutions that the, <laughs> that the computer generated, that the software generated. Um, uh, if, if you can um, understand what it, what it says, let me know. I would love to be able to solve all of our world's problems through typing something into the search bar. But unfortunately, um, it's not so much connected to reality, so it doesn't really mean that much. Um, this is, who's seen this before? It's very famous, it's Pablo Picasso's uh, bull. And um, this, this is a very important image to um, pair with the last few images because the thing is that Pablo Picasso and you know, many other prolific artists and innovators, the thing that makes them so special is the fact that they have vision. They can create their own style. Um, the AI software that I was showing you before, Dolly, only generates images based on previous styles, but it can't create a new style. And, you know, cubism um, is a new, I mean, it, it came from Picasso's vision, from his mind and his practice. So, this is the essence of authentic human creativity, which I truly believe, based on what we've um, heard in the last few minutes, that this is extraordinarily urgent, um, that we, we focus on what authentic human creativity means, because we, as humans, are the only, are the only ones who can really envision, um, who can really use our creativity to envision the future. Um, uh, technology has a incredible role and can support us in that, which we'll talk about after um, on the panel after this talk. But um, I do believe that it's this is very this is a very urgent matter. I believe that with passion. Um, but why? Because we clearly don't have a solutions problem. I mean, this this conference you've been presented with so many incredible solutions to our, cha our greatest challenges. Um, every speaker that's spoken, I mean, it's been so inspiring. You can, you can deduce, you know, what they're, that the fact that they're working on these things is um, clearly leading to, um, to uh, things that will really solve the challenges that we have. But we actually have a critical thinking problem. Um, and there are many barriers to critical thinking, but the two uh, main barriers are the fact that we uh, primarily have egocentric thinking, which is basically um, the, uh, the inability to focus on anything beyond uh, what is in relation to ourselves. So not being able to go beyond what we can perceive. And then, um, the other barrier is focusing on surface structure versus underlying structure. So this is basically, as it says, um, really only being able to focus on what's directly in front of us 
rather than uh, being able to create new dots or new tools in our toolbox. Um, and using those, uh, those tools that we have to create solutions. So using, um, using all these opportunities and connecting them. So the truth is that in the rush to be superhuman, our abilities have truly fallen short. Can we still connect the dots? Do we have, do we have a chance? What do we need in order to make that happen? So um, I set out to uh, attempt to, um, to solve this problem. So I started an organization called Paint the World, and what we do is place blank canvases in communities around the world and uh, um, see what happens. The, uh, the purpose is really twofold. It's um, to activate the creative capacity of the community that the canvas is in, but it's also, also, which is really interesting, to analyze the symbols and the meaning that comes from these collaborative pieces. So um, it's been evident through all of these canvases that we've placed around the world thus far that the canvases really do, the collaborative canvases really do tell a story of the community, a very accurate story of the community, because the truth is that usually the uh, decision makers in uh, communities or the, um, the leaders that have put themselves in that position um, or have been voted into that position, usually their, their voice doesn't totally represent um, the voices on the ground. So uh, you can learn so much through images as we have through this project. These are some examples. I mean, we, we have so many of these. It's just a, a small sampling of examples of collaborative images that have come from these communities. Um, they, the incredible thing about these is that when you look at them um, and you know what community they came from, they really actually feel like that community. You can, I mean, there have been so many um, studies and um, pieces written about the fact that you can actually really understand and um, predict the trajectory of a community if you look at the street art from that community. So um, we have developed a database of, uh, um, this so far has over a thousand symbols, um, symbols that appear in street art around the world. And this is our creative interpretation of those symbols. Um, the purpose of generating these is really to further connect with uh, people through um, different images on, on the importance behind this. Um, you can see we actually have a sampling of the symbol series directly outside, all of those colorful uh, pieces that you see on the right side of the entrance. And we've developed a city series, which is also, um, also a really interesting series that you can see outside. Um, the purpose of that is really to show the incredibly strong correlation between um, the arts and economic prosperity um, in each city that you see pictured. So um, we've also developed a color series talking about the meaning of um, these different colors and art around the world. Um, and uh, furthermore, we just launched this program, um, the Blank Canvas Method, which is a, um, we've been working with companies around the world to um, help their employees feel more comfortable with ambiguity. Uh, because when we have so many problems ahead of us, whether they're large or small, micro or macro, um, the truth is that it's a blank canvas. The blank canvas is really just a metaphor for um, something so much larger. So um, in closing, I ask you if you are a civic leader, a community leader of any kind, really think about how you can invest in your community's creativity, the opportunity that your community has to that your community members truly have to express themselves. Invest in the arts, because 
whether it's sustainability, technology, I mean, all of these issues that we're facing are so extraordinarily interconnected at the present moment. But if you give your community members the opportunity to create and to brainstorm, um, you'll be extraordinarily surprised at the connection between, um, between investment in the arts and uh, that your community's economics, your community's prosperity. Oh, and if you're a human, which I think we're all humans. Is anyone here not a human? Okay. If you're a human, then paint on the next blank canvas that you see. Um, there is a blank canvas here uh, that's in the tent. You can see it when you walk in. It's to the right. Paint on it. Um, but also, metaphorically, not just physically, paint on the next blank canvas that you see. Thank you so much.